Ticket Volume is excited to bring you a high velocity ITIL 4 co author, co author of Vera SM, Unwrapped and Applied, Top 25 Thought Leader by HDI for the last five years, a leader for women in DevOps and the women tech community. You might run into her at a conference because she's a regular speaker and contributor at service management conferences across the globe. Editorial Director for the Era of Humanizing IT docu-series. Welcome to Ticket Volume, news and information for improving IT experiences. I'm your host, Matt Barron, and this podcast is powered by Invigate, a global leader in IT service and asset management software. As you know, every week I chat with different IT leaders to share insights on service management, technology, business, and this episode is no exception. But before we start, don't forget to send me what you'd like to hear. Do you have some feedback? Subscribe to our podcast. Now, let's begin. Welcome to Ticket Volume, Simone Jo Moore. Thank you, Mr. Matt Barron. <laughs> Thank you for being here. You've got, obviously, you've got quite a reputation, and I've known you for several years. I love your energy and passion. You're one of the smartest lifelong learners I've ever met, and I do love High Velocity. I just got my hands on a copy, but what I'd really like to talk to you is about Vera SM, because I don't actually know much about Vera SM. I don't know anything about it, actually, except for that I know that it's a framework. So what is it? Well, so one of the things I'm actually just going to bring up now, but I was thinking about accents. I've had this issue because, you know, as an Aussie and I moved to France, I didn't speak the language, so I had to learn the language. Also, too, that I've recently gone home for the first time in five years. So my family say, you know, Annie Simone, you speak funny now. So it's really... <laughs> accents have quite a thing even in the way that we actually pronounce or what it is that we're talking about in the framework so I love it for me I just simply call it verism very oh. simple from that yes so very sm or verism you know Aussies are known for being pretty simple in the way that we talk about things or the way that we actually uh, what's the word I'm looking for the way we shorten words I guess you're playful with language Yes, we are somewhat playful with the language itself, absolutely. And I think it's really important to think about how we, even the taxonomy, how we call things is really important in frameworks, regardless of what the framework is, because it changes people's perceptions. Mm -hmm. it, the nuances in the language really makes a difference. So I have found that I've had to adapt the way I talk about certain things, including our wonderful person. Now, I must, 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 must. The authors absolutely adore them. Some of them have been key mentors for me. You know, Joan Bota and Claire Agata, and you even have your famous Suzanne Van Hoven. And I loved the fact that like many of the other books, like Mark Smalley with High Velocity IT and his team that did the actual authoring, to be a contributing author and to be asked to be a contributing author is kind of special, you know. So in the Verism, I contributed in the second book, which was the more practical side, which is Verism Applied, and worked with, you'll know this name too, from Australia, April Allen on the knowledge management section mm -hmm. and KMing is such a huge thing. I mean, it's, let's face it, knowledge is the lifeblood of any organization, isn't it? Bingo. How yep. you flow the data and, and all of that sort of thing. But the one thing that I absolutely adore on the practical side about Verism itself, and, and just to, just to put it into some context, it isn't just about IT. It's not just about service management from a tech perspective. It's about managing services from an organizational level and they have something that i really enjoy called the mesh so google it guys just verism mesh and what i like about the mesh is how they are weaving together all the different aspects it's not just the tech side it's not just the process side but it includes all the different types of resources that come into an organization the people aspects and so on and so forth. So even though you can look at a mesh like, you know, the square and the way it weaves together, that really suits me as a practitioner, as a framework mixologist, as someone that doesn't rely on just one framework, but I like that unique cocktail. Mm. 
So using something like the various in MASH really helps to bring in all the different frameworks, what's currently in organization, and overlay that with where they want to be and have a really clear picture about that gap Mm -hmm. and then actually make a decision because sometimes you don't want to fill that gap because you actually want want to shift the weave. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so that I, I actually really like... Back in episode episode 21, Katrina McDermott actually posed a metaphor similar to that, where you take little bits of processes to form a recipe towards mm-hmm. a value stream, as I till four would, would specify. And you, <gasps> I, I love the cocktail reference, you know? Yes. Take, take what you like out of different frameworks, use what works in each framework. And I think mm-hmm. that's what people are really looking for, that concept of a mesh, or value stream, or they're looking for that je ne sais quoi, that one thing that helps me think about work differently. How French of you to use a term like that. <laughs> I'm sure my pronunciation was terrible. Oh, no, it was actually quite lovely. Um, no, but it's right, it is. I mean, people are looking for the it factor. So IT factor, the it factor. I know, terrible pun. That was just awful. That was so vaudeville. But that it factor, looking for that je ne sais quoi, looking for what is it that I know? That's really what je ne sais quoi is, is I don't know what it is. It just is. And it just has that thing. And that is a very human element Mm -hmm. because that comes back to people. That comes back to culture. And a lot of people don't realise that when we're looking for that what is that thing? I'm going to make a reference to one of my favorite grommets, Paul Wilkinson, and his shiny new things, because everyone's looking for that. Oh, look, it glitters. Yeah. But that doesn't necessarily mean that's what we're looking for. Sometimes what glitters, it just distracts us. And it's like, oh, look, squirrel. And it's like, <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, let's just come back to where we are. For me, one of the biggest things is that we haven't, really delved into the it factor, if you like, of what already exists where we are. Mm-hmm. We've lost over it. We've lost that sense of, oh, I don't know, curiosity within what already exists. It's like having, you know, you go into the pantry because you haven't been able to go shopping and you just pull the pantry door open and you go, hmm, now what have I got? And... What could I do with that? I do that with my bar cabinet too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. What can I do with that old dark rum I've got back there? Yeah. You know, there's some pretty cool stuff that can happen with that. I, I really like this observation because you're totally 100% spot on. People get excited for a cocktail, a recipe, a framework. They go to the store They go get the new thing. Oh, it's going to be new. It's going to change my life. And the same thing with frameworks. You know, when we see something new, oh, a new project, we have to implement this on this new project. Whereas what you're saying, pause and reflect. What technology and services are you delivering today? Can you find interest, intrigue, and invest in improving those? Yeah, or reinventing them. Mm -hmm. I I think that's a such a huge difference. Again, uh, and you'll know this name, one of my absolute favorite mentors, Ivor McFarlane. Oh, yes. Yes. And so I always like to quote him, but I love how he used to say innovation starts with disobedience. Mm. So in the things that we do, there is no perfect process. There's no perfect flow as such. There will be junctions we come across and we go, oh my God, how, how do I get around that? And sometimes it's not getting around it. Sometimes it's getting over it, under it, through it. So when I think about that whole VUCA environment, you know, it's really volatile, it's ambiguous, it's complex, it's, you know, all of those things about it. I would rather try and look at what we currently have and say, well, what's really vibrant about what we've got? We talk about, you know, when we're really excited about something, we say, oh, that's unreal, you know, or wow, that's crazy. So it's, that's the curiosity. Let, let's check it out. Or something that when we finally get there, it's like, wow, that's astounding. 
I would rather VUCA be changed from its current <laughs> nomenclature to actually be, you know, that vibrant, unreal, crazy and astounding environment. And I think the, the key part of that for me from a curiosity perspective, because I think that's what keeps me on the edge and always wanting to, you know, be comfortable, I guess, being on the edge a little bit, is that are we doing new things or are we doing things in new ways? Mm. That's the big difference for me. Mm -hmm. Yes. And can we find uh, not only that curiosity, but also comfort yeah. in addressing what we already have built uh -huh. and what we are already delivering? And, mm. and, and is your culture humble enough to do so? Wow, that's a powerful word. When I think about being humble enough to let certain things go and explore. Decades ago, yes, I've been a coder. Yes, I was dev. And it, and it really is a different headspace to being in the value stream flow as such or where mm -hmm. you see yourself in. But the one thing I love about where we are at is that shift where even the everyday can be seen as part of that flow and you can be in the flow as you create but recognizing what that is, how you get into it, how you make the most of your energy while you're in it. Because one of my big things is there is an ebb and flow. There is always ebb and flow. All you have to do is look at nature. Look at what our oceans do. Look at what the seasons do. And the same thing happens in human beings. I mean, let's face it, <laughs> like, you know, my mates in the Nordics, they're always like, oh, come, you know, you'll love it if you come and live up this way. And I know it's so beautiful. It's gorgeous. I love it. But as an Aussie, I can't live in the dark for that many hours a day. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but it is incredible. It is an experience, but there is an ebb and flow and there's a rhythm to what we do. And it's that rhythm that I think we don't always understand or we're not hearing it or we're not tapping into it when it comes to those value stream flows or the flow of our people, the way they think, the way they work. Mm. I mean, the, the one thing that has always been critical for me because I also have that complementary health background and incorporating that into well-being and my people, the way, just the way they think, just the way they operate, where are they at? Can you tap into that? You know what? Maybe 2 a.m. for some people works perfect. So why am I saying, why aren't you here at 3 p.m.? And it's like, well, because I was kind of up at 2.30 and I did two hours of recoding at 2.30 in the morning because that's when it hit me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it can be really difficult for organizations to work with that because we've been so structured. It's the boundary lines have been so solid. And for the last couple of years, we've had a really good taste of what it's like to not actually be confined mm. Mm -hmm. by those boundaries. There's a fine balance now with people trying to become hybrid and, and tap into those things. And the difficulty is, especially for things like service desk, we are required to be there when we said we would be there. We did commit to that. We said to the customers, this is when we'll be there for you. So there is a requirement for certain structures and for certain timelines. And at the same time, there's the other element of fluidity that has to live around it. Yeah, I love this. It's such a good concept to, to appreciate that and what the people need and then build diverse teams so that you can actually provide the structured people provide the structure, the unstructured people provide yeah. that exploratory, the, the needful, the ad hoc. So we've been talking about what you label flow science, a term that you kind of whispered in my ear and mentioned briefly. And I was like, flow, I love flow. You know when you're in your flow because you, that, is, that is the magic of, of what we do, knowledge work, uh, physical yeah. work. Here's the perfect example of what it's about. And it was because of my complementary health work and all the studies I've done in the last three decades being in that space where I've covered Polynesian healing systems and a whole heap of other stuff. But coming across flow science, 
where <laughs> some people, it was a very sad moment, you know, earlier, but we had Mihai Csikszentmihalyi is the father of flow science as we know it today. And then I started following what was going on in the Flow Genome Project. And that was part of what co-founders Stephen Kotler and Jamie Wheel started looking at as well. And, and my part of that, when I was looking at it in comparison to what I've done with work and how I've built programs for my people and my teams to sort of, you know, get in the zone. We're talking about being yeah. in the zone, right? So really in a flow state, this is, you know, this is when a person's performing, you know, when they're fully immersed, fully immersed in experiencing that feeling of being completely energized, completely focused, and a really deep enjoyment while we're doing it. Because if you're not enjoying it, you get kicked out of flow, right? Yeah. So one of the key things that I've always talked about and have done even before I came across this particular studies in, in the project was wear, tear, rest and repair cycle. So if I think about the wear cycle, you know, we get, get in, we're, we're starting our work, it's fine. We're starting to tear into our system even when we're waking up for the day. And it doesn't always feel good to start with and we can be a little unwilling to, to get out of bed, I guess. <laughs> Do I have to? Do I have to do that job? Do I have to talk to that person? Really, do I need to do that meeting? So there's always a little struggle, I guess, in that first part. But there's a cognitive cost to our brain when we do that. Mm. And we find ways to distract ourselves, to avoid it if we can. So that's when I'm like, oh, I'll just check my Instagram or let me just check my Twitter. Oh, I'll just do this instead, you know. So that wear bit can be a little bit dangerous. But once you start getting into the wear cycle, you're really starting to get into the mode of doing something. This is, you know, when you start getting into that zone, we're starting to tear into though. We're taking the challenge on. We're now starting to the tear. That's where our brain is shifting from that conscious to subconscious processing and we're finding ourselves, wow, we're in it. I can see that basket. I know where I've got to shoot. I can taste the balance in that meal. Oh, you know what? I'm not going to measure the teaspoon. I'll just give it a sprinkle in that recipe. Or in the code, sometimes you're actually looking at it, but when you look at it sideways, your brain shifts, so you're not looking directly at left, right, or right, left processing. You're actually seeing it from a different angle and you you really start there's still a cognitive cost because now we're starting to wear into our mm. energy levels you know with that tear wear and tear but there's a point where we can only sustain that for so long we've got to go into rest but in the rest phase as you dip into that rest phase this is when we start to flow better this is when mm. we start to get into the zone because we're like wow this is feeling easy i've yeah. actually felt completely relaxed in this wow I can actually just find myself you know maneuvering with where I want to go what a beautiful state <laughs> yeah this is this is the like you know those days where there's some days where you like you get to the end of the day and you think oh freak I didn't get anything done mm -hmm. you're just like but in but in but then you know you just, yeah yeah interrupt you know. interrupt 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 yeah, you're getting all these tiny little pieces thing and you get to the end of the day and you think, what the hell did I get done? Nothing. Yeah. But then there's those other days, same days, and I've had this on service desks where you get call after call after call and it's like, mm, 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 mm. and then there are other days you get call after call after call, but because you're actually in this flow state, you're just like, oh, you're just maneuvering from one to the other in an ease state. You know, this is why we call, you know, we call about, at ease right we're we're feeling at ease we're, we're just in our zone everything feels in balance of where we should be but this is where disease comes from because we're dis at ease so there's ease and dis at ease this is the way it goes so when we get the dis at ease when we find that we've gotten to the end of our energy levels we can only sustain that for so long then we go into repair mode and that's our recovery now the thing with that is that you know Everything that happened during that peak performance and you see all the new possibilities, but now we have to actually move into that state where we need to just, okay, time to step back. We've got to renew our energy levels. Mm. You know, this is that wear, tear, 
rest and repair. Now, if we go and wear and we're in tear, if you keep that tear going, you know there's people that go for shift after shift after shift. And, oh, no, 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 I'll just do another hour. Just do another half hour. You know what's going to happen? Crash yeah. and burn, maybe. Yeah. Crash and burn. Some people's wear and tear cycle, wear, tear, rest and repair cycle can be a whole shift. And for other people, it's going to be little tiny circles all the way through that shift. That is such a good thing to have on the podcast. It's so much like in so many other aspects of our life, like weightlifting or building any skill and just being aware of your boundaries and your capabilities. This is kind of where the intersection of flow and humanizing IT lives, right? Once you understand that flow and how you can get into it, now not only do you have to adapt, but your manager has to adapt, your team has to adapt, your organization has to adapt in order to get the most out of you and to keep you <laughs> from going insane, <laughs> losing your mind and walking out the door. <laughs> well, look, not to say that we don't have our emotional hijacks. Right. I like to take it beyond emotional intelligence. And to those that are listening, check out Dr. Suzanne David. I love her work around emotional agility because it just takes that next step further. And there's lots of other tools that I use as well because, wow, it's such a powerful thing to you know even when you're in an emotional hijack which by the way takes around 18 to 20 minutes so it's like oh god this is you need to go away for a while um <laughs> it happens right yeah. we just here um is with the understanding of the people around you or the people you work with or with your boss is that this is something that does happen we don't always know what's below the waterline with people we don't always understand what those triggers are. And rather than admonish people for that, there is unacceptable behavior. I'm not talking about truth. You know, there is unacceptable behavior. Yeah. Absolutely. And you deal with it at the time and it's like, okay, come on, time out. <laughs> You're a parent, you know. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm a human. I do it to myself. <laughs> yeah, time exactly. out, Matt. <laughs> wow. Time out time. Yeah, it does happen. But it can be very hard for yourself because how many times has there been when you've been on a rant? Like you didn't mean to, to go off because obviously something triggered it. Obviously you were really passionate about the topic, but something has triggered it. And you sort of, you know, logically you see it happening, you observe it happening, you're aware it's happening. But for some reason, the whole chemical interaction that's going on neurologically and with your body is going, you know what? I'm going there. Yeah. I'm sorry, but that's All where in. I'm going. <laughs> and, uh, you know, if you can help me maneuver me um, to another spot where it can just go on for a bit, where I'm not hurting anyone or, um, yeah. Yeah, this is, this is the thing. I think the reality is, is that even virtually or face-to-face, -face, it doesn't matter these things occur and empathic leadership is critical in the current time. The thing is, I think empathic leadership has always been important. Mm -hmm. It just hasn't had the focus that it's started to get in the last few years. Yeah, yeah. And just like you said at the beginning, using the words helps us think. It gives us that reference and that framework mm -hmm. to think about it. And something I was thinking about while you were talking was... We can't have a perfect IT stack. There's no such thing as a perfect tech stack. There's no such thing as a perfect human lived workplace experience either. Mm -hmm. And you need to adjust for both and be willing yeah. for incidents of both types to arise. Absolutely fantastic. Such good concepts. I love that you gave some shout outs for people who want to dig deeper too. How can people connect with you and learn more? Oh, okay. Um, all right. Snapshot bio, LinkedIn. <laughs> Shocker. <laughs> Hello. Uh, no, best place. Did you know that around, I think it's now up to 99.7% of HR actually now uses LinkedIn as its formal spot for recruiting. And, Excellent. Well, even if, even if they get a contact through another channel, they're immediately on your LinkedIn profile. Oh, yeah. Coaching tip, get your LinkedIn profile up to date keep it up today because every time you shift so does it shift you can always go to my website so www.simonejoemore.com 
Awesome. Well, thank you for being on Ticket Volume, Simone. It was lovely to have you. Thank you very much. It's so cool to see you again and have a chat. Likewise. And for our audience, thanks for listening to this episode. We've got a bunch more out there with people that have been shouted out on this episode, like Mark Smalley's coming on. We've got to have Claire Agatar on. We've got to have April Allen on. So make sure to subscribe to receive an alert when those come out. You can also submit ideas for topics or guests. Just DM me or send me an email, matt at ticketvolume.com. Don't forget to please leave feedback or a review because the algorithm will reward us with your interactions. This podcast is brought to you by Invigate, the all-in-one IT service and asset management system that helps organizations with world-class IT support teams. If you're looking for a solution to build your help desk without the headaches of year-long implementations, you will love Invigate. In fact, IT teams from NASA, Toyota, and McDonald's use Invigate to manage requests, automate workflows, and centralize inventory data so they can focus on delivering better service. Thanks for hitting play, and I'll see you around the way. Mm-hmm.